Can you tell us a few words about you and about the tool you want to show us? Sure. I'm Hamza Tahir, uh, one of the co-founders of ZenML. And at ZenML, we are creating an open source MLOps framework that is built in a way to encourage the iterative and experimental nature of machine learning work. So, but the real value of our work um, is that our extensible framework also provides a path to an automated and production ready software base that can be deployed in, on any cloud or backend service. So that's what we're working on at Zenable. Mm -hmm. So it's like a platform for hosting models, right? For serving it's models. A, I like to call it a framework because a platform is opinionated, but a framework mm -hmm. is not. And what we're trying to do is we have a bunch like a, let's say a plethora of MLOps tools that solve different problems. And there's nothing that really brings them together or that combines them into something which is coherent and nice to use. And with ZenML, what we're doing is we're using um, it as a pipelining tool. So you do build pipelines, but the actual power of it is that this, these pipelines can be deployed with no opinions based on the tooling that you want to use to solve these problems or the infrastructure where you want to deploy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I understand the difference between a platform and the framework. Kim, okay, quite interested in seeing this. All right, then should we get into it straight away? Mm -hmm. All right. So I prepared um, a bunch of notebooks. I think uh, our tool is really meant for ML practitioners, but a lot of data scientists really like our tool. And I think the reason is that we encourage them to take ownership of their workflows in production. So as a data scientist, you have you know, a lot of struggles to productionize machine learning. You're far away from it, maybe as a data scientist. But with ZenML, you can see all these tools around you. We try to give you a window into them so that it's easy and zen. And how do we do that? So I'm going to show you the basics first. Uh, the initialization stuff we can skip over. Um, this is really the main part of it. So when you want to create your first pipeline with ZenML, all you have to do is import decorators in Python. So, so it's a complete Python-based tool, by the way. So um, for now, we just support Python. And you have to decorate your Python functions, which are very simple, um, with um, type hints. So integers, floats, strings, or any other custom objects. And that's all the extra work you need to do. You, you can just decorate it with that step, and that works. Then you also define a function that defines your workflow for your pipeline. Um, and this function is also very simple. You have three steps that go into it. The first step and the second step are just called. And the result of these two are put into the third step. And then we can plug in these parameters to actual function names right here. And this is what we call a run. So we go from defining a pipeline to getting it to run. And you can do this all with no fuss, no, just a pip install and it works. And you can see that there's a bunch of logs here, but essentially what happens is the pipeline run finished in these, this point. If you wanted to run the function directly, you could do it. But what I really like to um, show the first uh, time when people use NML is the post execution workflow, which is after you run a pipeline, um, what do you do? So essentially you can get your pipelines very simply into your notebook. You can get your runs. So the pipeline can have multiple runs. Uh, this is the last run that I did and my steps. So what I'm doing is I'm getting my last step, which is the step add. And I'm, I can read the output of that step. So of course, two plus three is five. So you get five here. And then, so that's the basics, right? Uh, it's, it, it, and it looks right now probably like a lot of tools that you might've used with pipelining, um, but we try to make it specific to machine learning and I'll show you how. So the first thing you might've noticed in these pipelines are that they're data centric, not task centric. So what flows between these steps are not scheduled things like, like in Airflow but actual data, right? So a data integer goes from one step to the other. Um, and then you're able to visualize these with our integrations. So ZenML has, is very integration heavy. 
as I told you at the start, we want to link all the tools together. And one of the cool tools that I like to show is our integration with Dash. Um, this allows us to visualize pipeline runs. And you can see, for example, the pipeline that I just ran. Um, so the circles are steps, these are artifacts, and you can see that actually they are not in memory objects, but they are actually stored in your local artifact store. And we can therefore do something very interesting. So I can plug in my another step instead of my B step. So if you remember my step B was returning three. If I create another step which returns 10, I can use the same pipeline to plug in this step and then I can visualize this again. And you would see something really interesting happening. Excuse me, I just have to copy this. So the post execution workflow, I need to get the right pipeline for that. Yeah, here you go. And you would be able to see that now the step that I use is actually C, not B. And right now everything is green because I ran it before and all the steps are cached. But if I actually change a step, if I change it to, for example, 11, then like XenML will actually pick up that something has changed. And now you can see this part of the DAG is blue. So the first part was cached completely and the second part is, is new calculated. And this is really helpful when you're doing data centric pipelines and as experiments. So when you're using machine learning, you're probably running through your pipelines again and again as experiments, logging experiments, and you don't want to always rerun pre-processing or importing all the time. So like XML takes care of that for you. So that's really chapter number one, that's basics. And then we'll move on to the real cool features in the second chapter, but I can stop for if you have any questions. Yes, I do. So my first question was, why do we need to bother with all the, the decorators if we can just run this? But I think you answered that because mm -hmm. we get all this extra functionality around like this nice uh, visualization of uh, dark caching, all these things. I am wondering though, where is this thing uh, executed? Like, is it like the usual, mm -hmm. like, is it executed the, within the same process or you can say, I want to execute it elsewhere within a different process or I don't know, use Celery or use Kubernetes or something like this. So now you're getting ahead of me. Um, okay. So, so that's, that's exactly, that. so that's exactly the power of it. So mm -hmm. right now it's running locally. So the orchestrator, so like what you described is in what in our language an orchestrator is the local orchestrator, which is just the same Python process. Um, but the um, you can switch orchestrators to Kubeflow or Airflow or Kubernetes or whatever orchestration that you would like, but that's encapsulated in this concept, which we call a stack. And I can show you that in the third chapter. Okay, so probably we should uh, look at the, the second first, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's do it. So. So here's, here's this chapter. And right now I didn't do anything about machine learning. So this chapter is basically about um, some more integrations that are very machine learning specific and machine learning pipelines. So we transition into machine learning pipelines. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start building a basic machine learning pipeline and then try to get it production ready towards the end of this chapter. So, the first thing you do is you install the integrations again. So we're going to be using a bunch of integrations. We're going to use MLflow, Evidently, Dash, Scalern. I think uh, Evidently, uh, Emily was on. I, I saw a video a few uh, weeks ago. Yes, she was. So we're going to see their tool, MLflow, awesome tool. We're going to see that as well. Um, so let's get right into it. So the first few things are just set up. Uh, again, it's about stacks. Uh, let's get into that in the next chapter. But what we're gonna really be doing here is we're going to be building this simple pipeline. Import data, train the model, evaluate the model. Very simple. Um, it's exactly the same as before, but rather than returning integers, now you're returning NumPy arrays. You're training SVCs from sklearn and you're evaluating scores and returning it. And now, if I actually get my pipeline, I have to do some real-time editing because all this, <laughs> this function is the wrong function. 
let's see. Okay, so now I'll visualize this again and you'll see something really interesting. So now we have NumPy arrays, right, instead of the integers. All of this is green just because it's cached. I ran it before the call. But the cool thing is um, that now everything, you know, you see the power of caching. Your, even your models are cached, your data is cached. So it, it can be very fast uh, if you use NML, even in an experimentation setting. But what's even more interesting is because these pipelines are modular, right? And you can just experiment with them in the notebook. You can start attaching steps to them which are relevant for production. So for instance, let's say you wanted to use evidently for grid uh, detection. What you could do is you could simply add two more steps to your pipeline, put them in, give them the result of your importer. So let's say you wanted to compare the training and the test set, and then evaluate a drift detection report. At this point, I'm not really talking about evidently, I'm just adding the drift detection step as an abstract step. And here, what I do is I use the ZenML evidently integration step to import a standard step, which we have if you install the ZenML evidently package. And then it's very easy. I can actually run the pipeline with this step built in. I don't really need to do much else. And then you can see that this step runs and I can even use a visualizer to visualize whether drift happens or not, as simple as that in your pipeline. So this is, I mean, I'm not gonna go into this. Emily must have talked about this at length. This is a data report, but this is generated Actually. with, so this is uh, basically evidently integrating. But if you wanted to use, for example, Y logs, or if you wanted to use some other drift detection tools, um, you could plug those in as well. So that's, that's what we want to do. The next one is about Discord. It's basically, if you wanted an alert, integration, so if you wanted chat ops going, but I'll actually skip over that one. I think it's not so interesting to see a message on Discord that uh, Drift is detected or not. So, but you can see that it's very easy to do. We just... believe it will happen. <laughs> you should believe it will happen. Uh, the one that I want to focus on is really MLflow because MLflow is in, is in the category of tools primarily used for experiment tracking. And here what we do is we um, supercharge our training step and you could do it with any step with MLflow. And all you have to do is you have to import the MLflow decorator called enable MLflow and then use MLflow as normal within your step. So for people who already have MLflow and use it, it this is familiar to them. This is basically logging all your MLflow components within your function. And the cool thing about this is that I can just plug out my trainer step put in the MLflow enabled one, run it, right? And then there's a handy utility that allows me to visualize MLflow runs straight in my, um, like straight in my MLflow setup. And the cool thing I like say is that this, the name of the pipeline is the same as the name of the experiment name. And the name of the pipeline run is the same as the experiment run name. So there's a complete lineage between all of your pipeline runs and what you track in MLflow. And you don't really have to set up MLflow. You don't have to set it up you know, locally or anything. We take care of that for you. And this is part of the stack component. And of course, you can see what they logged, all the parameters it logged, all the metrics it logged. This is all MLflow stuff, nothing to do with NML, right? But you could imagine you could replace the same thing with weights and biases, Neptune or whatever. I can even run another step and compare it. Um, but uh, I mean, it's the same thing. So now I just replaced my model with a decision tree classifier rather than an SVC. And I would be able to just visualize it again very easily. I should use port, the other port. And you can see now there are two pipelines. Um, these, by the way, are old. You can ignore them. We can even compare them. And one is, of course, using um, an SVC and one is using a decision tree. So you have the power of comparing all your experiments. And this is actually the start of a concept that we're trying to push it over to MLOps, which is pipelines as experiments. 
So we want your experiments to be pipelines from the start because if you start thinking in pipelines from the very get-go, it will be amazing as you transition to production, which I'll show you in a second. So now we're going to go towards adding a deployment step to our pipeline, which is, which is part of CI, CD, CT in MLOps. Um, I'll show you that in a second, but maybe you have some questions for what we've seen so far. No, all good. The amazing integration. So that seems very easy to integrate with uh, other tools. That's yeah, good job. amazing. Thank you. All right, I'm going to show you the last one, which I wanted to focus today. That's the deployer. So uh, I don't know, Alexei, how you guys do it at OLX, but when when we, you know, when I did ML in production, what I did was there was always a trigger step, which said true or false, whether we should trigger it or not, and that was testing my, you know, my latest model with something else, and then it was deployed if the thing passed. So that's what we're going to add to our pipeline. Interesting. Yeah. So all we're going to do is we're just going to do deployment decision. Deployment trigger is, again, it's the same, right? I don't need to go over the pipeline code all the time. But essentially what I'm doing here is my logic is if drift happens, do not deploy, right? If drift does not happen, deploy. Simple. So that's what I'm encoding here. I can get the previous artifact from the drift report. And I can actually use our ML flow deployer. So MLflow, I, I know I kept saying it's an experiment tracking tool, but for those of you who know MLflow, it's also a model deployment tool. So with the same integration, you can you also have for free deployments with MLflow. Um, and again, it's the same. So all you have to do is import a standard step, MLflow deployer step, plug it into your pipeline just like this, and run the pipeline. And here's something that interesting that will happen. You can see that it said stopping service and then it said starting service, right? So that's what I mean when I say continuous deployment. Uh, ZenML has this notion of services, which are external APIs that live outside of the pipeline. And with ZenML, what you can do is you have services as a first class citizen. So for example, um, what we have is an MLflow deployment service that points to an MLflow deployed model. Um, MLflow can deploy it locally. So I'm, I just deployed this model locally in my machine. But the cool thing is that ZenML is always aware of all your previous deployments because it, it, you know, you're just continuously deploying it with the same pipeline. So it can do strategies like spinning down your service and deploying a new model you know, and take care of the orchestration of the deployment for you. And this is really cool because you can list all your models with our CLI. Um, so you can see that there's one model which is deployed right now in the stack, um, and you could see the pipeline where it was deployed, who deployed it. You could visualize the pipeline where it was trained on. So you have complete data lineage across the entire piece. And I could even fetch that service into my pipeline and actually make a prediction straight from my notebook and ZML would help you with that. So you can do service.predict. This is MNIST by the way. So, you know, if I actually try to visualize what I predicted, I always ask in all my demos, is this an eight or a zero? I don't know. Uh, our model predicted it's an eight. So I would also believe Jan Likun. Looks who like did. nine without uh, a bit of, uh, <laughs> but we're probably closer to eight, yes. Yeah, cool. All right. That was continuous deployment. If, if, you, if I keep running this, by the way, you'll always see that there will be one deployed model spin it down, spin it back. And that's cool. Everything is local. You have your experiment tracking, you have your drift detection, you have your model deployment. Now you're at a really, I would say, some semi-production pipeline with even chat ops included. But you you asked me at the very start, Hamza, this is all local. What, what is happening? This is local orchestration. What is What is happening? So obviously you're right. And this is where I will now answer your question. So what are we really doing at ZenML um, is that we, the complete transformative power, I believe of the tool is that we take this particular state where everything is local with these tools and we then are able to transition you to the cloud where everything is production. And you as a data scientist don't need to worry about that. And the way I'll do that is I'll swap out the ML flow deployment with Selden, right? That's very easy. It's the same importing the Selden deployment step. And I'll 
switch my orchestration to Kubeflow running on AWS, right? Um, and that's what showed here. And that's really, I mean, you would say, okay, how, how, how easy is that? And I would say it's very easy because you don't actually even have to do that as a data scientist. We, we have the configuration of all these tools we have encapsulated in our CLI. So actually maybe your engineering team can set this up for you. You can do it yourself as well if you're familiar with these tools, but all you have to do is install the appropriate integrations. You can list all your stacks. Um, I have three stacks right now. You can read the names. One is default and one is the AWS one, which I'm gonna show you. And what, what the AWS one will look like is, uh, I mean, a stack is basically your, look, think of it as your MLOps stack, right? Your MLOps platform. So what does your MLOps platform need? It needs an orchestrator. It needs an artifact store where you store artifacts. It needs an experiment tracking tool. Maybe it needs a registry to push your Docker images. It probably needs um, a deployment tool, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's all what ZenML has abstracted away. So what we do is we go from that local stack where everything was local to something where EKS, you know, you have EKS where Qflow is deployed already in production. You have the S3 artifact store uh, instead of your local file system. You have your metadata store, which can be MySQL. You have an elastic container registry if you're an AWS shop you, and secrets, you need to handle those. So there's a notion of a secrets manager. And then you have a deployment tool so we use the MLflow deployer. That's the first, uh, in chapter one, I set up the stack, right? So that was the MLflow deployer. But now I'm gonna switch that deployer to the Selden deployer. And Selden, if, if for those, I don't know if you have had Ed or Clive on. Um, no. Nope, okay, I'll ask them to come by. <laughs> yeah, so, please. I tried uh, asking them, they didn't answer. <laughs> okay, <I'll, laughs> so, so it's a fantastic tool. It lets you deploy models on Kubernetes. Hmm. And, how do I actually make this stack? You don't do it in Python, right? You have to do it in the CLI, essentially. So here's the piece of code that you need. You, you always, so we have a convention like ZenML stack component, then register. So ZenML artifact store register, ZenML orchestrator register, ZenML metadata store register. And you can see that with simple commands, I'm able to transition over to an AWS shop and these are not so complicated. So, I mean, I don't want to dive into it. We don't have so much time, but I mean, it's setting up a container registry and ECR, it's setting up in Qflow pipelines orchestrator, S3 store, Selden, secret manager. And then this final command, that's the important one. It's doing ZenML stack register, give it a unique name, right? And then it's saying, okay, the metadata store is this one, the artifact store is this one, the orchestrator is this one, the ECR is this one. And you can sort of start seeing that you're combining all your MLOps components, putting them into this one configuration package. And like ZenML will also tell you if it's, it's incompatible or not, right? So, you know, we, we, we push all everything together and then you can set it active. So you can do ZenML stack set, give it the name, and then you're able to transition from your local stack or your default stack to your production stack. And this is what we imagine that our users would do uh, you would, they would have like maybe 10 stacks. Some are running in development, some are running in staging, some in production. And then you can switch through these stacks like that, right? And then, I mean, I just put all the pipeline in, in the scripts now. So now what I'll do is, I mean, I ran this before. So when I run this command, it's the same code as before, the same pipeline code. But now, rather than trying to run it locally in a process, uh, ZenML understands that the stack has a container registry, so it wants you to build a Docker image. So then it automatically builds your Docker image, it pulls in your requirements, uh, bundles that together, pushes that image to the container registry, and then launches a job on your orchestrator. And this is what I did just before we came. I mean, I can run this again, just as you speak, but you can see that it's running on Kubeflow. So, I just run this again and it'll, you know, um, I, I should have set the stack after. So you can see what happened. So it was still using the local stack, um, but I want to switch stacks. So I should run this cell first. 
So it switched the active stack to AWS. And now I, now I should run it. And now what will happen is that it will understand that it's using the different stack and now start building the Docker image. And if we wait a while, what's gonna happen is something like on AWS Kubeflow, if you have that set up, you will see something like this, where all that pipeline that you saw locally is running in, in pods, you know, uh, everything is tracked with the S3 artifact store. You can do all the local art, um, post execution workflow that I showed you, the same as you did before, but you're able to transition across. Um, and uh, it's already run through actually. So actually if I port forward my kubectl, I would be able to, hmm, yeah, in a second. I think there might be a new pipeline. Let's see, yeah, there it is. And you can actually see, you know, it, it, it's gonna cache again, but you have all these steps running now in Kubeflow, which is deployed on our managed AWS. Um, and I don't know if you noticed it, I'll go to the previous pipeline. This time, my last step is not MLflow, it's Selden. So we also have a Selden deployer. Um, and as this is deployed already, I can stop it. And if I list, I mean, I don't need to run this again. You can see that now my model, which is deployed is in Selden. Um, you can also predict on it and do everything that you did with MLflow, but this time you'll be querying Kubernetes. So yeah, I don't know how fast that was. You said uh, to be asked. Yeah, like it's amazing that in 20 minutes, uh, we went this uh, like journey from zero to hero sort of, like you just showed, okay, here's how you train this thing locally. And now at the end, all of a sudden we have like the full blown production, uh, uh, set up with uh, Kubeflow, Selden, and uh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, you must have put uh, a lot of work into making this happen. That's amazing work. Yeah, we we have been working night and day for, I mean, it's a very young project. So it's only been six to eight months that we're working on it, but we have a very strong team, 11 people, all engineers, experienced, um, and can only shout out to them. Um, so our community is developing. I hope that people who see this will also contribute because we're an open source solution. We don't have a paid offering yet. Uh, we are a startup, but right now we're building the community. And uh, what we really want is people to add more integration. So if you have a tool that you want to integrate with ZenML, let us know, join our Slack, and mm -hmm. we can help you integrate it. So you answered uh, the two questions I had, like how many people work on this? You said 11, right? And then uh, the best way to contribute is uh, to try to see what integrations are missing. Let's say if somebody actually wants to get their hands dirty and uh, contribute mm -hmm. like uh, some code, um, do you have like first good issues that they can take? So yes, so if you go to, uh, I'll just, I mean, as I'm sharing my screen, I'll use this. So we do have some good first issues uh, here. Um, not many, so we're gonna add more to this after this video, but you can get your hands dirty on this. On, on the ZenML repository, if you do give, come here, by the way, please do give us a star. Yeah, very um, important, like uh, your amazing work deserves a star. I Maybe I could, like if I could put two, I would. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And we have a contributing guide, so you can, we have a formatting structure and we use the fork and pull git workflow, so it's quite simple. So you can contribute like this. And also if you come on Slack, zenml.io slash slack dash invite, you just need to go to that URL, you'll get a Slack invite. And also I wanted to share one more project. So we have the ZenML main repository, but we have other repositories that help people to learn about ZenML outside of the docs, obviously, which is ZenBytes and Zen files. So ZenBytes are the thing that I just demoed. It's like a, we want to use it to also teach people ML ops. Right, that's one of our main things. So we're using ZenML. But if you go to Zen files, they're actually production grade projects that are using ZenML. So you can go, I mean, there are three right now. One is about, for example, using Streamlit. Um, and if, if people go to Zen files, they would be able to read all about how to really do this in production properly. And even here we have this Streamlit app, which is basically, if you know Streamlit again, another tool, you are able to even visualize your model. Um, and you know, with ZenML, you can continuously deploy pipelines and use a data app like Streamlit. Um, yeah, so yeah, just a bit of teaser there at the end. 
uh, maybe I can stop sharing now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, so when you send me all the links, we will make sure that they are in the description. So maybe last question. Do you have any advice for anyone who is watching this? Um, so anybody who's working with NML or just generally? Who's watching with... this video, but it can be okay. anything from life advice to people getting started with ZenML. So I, I mean, I'm, I give advice sparingly as I'm very early in my own journey, mm -hmm. but I would say that work hard unapologetically, but stick true to your opinions, but also be cognizant that there are many people around you who probably have thought this, the same things and have gone through similar journeys. So while you know you have to be stubborn sometimes, but sometimes you also need to listen to feedback and um, treat it as as valuable and move on. When you do hear advice, you know you shouldn't just try to push it away. Try to like get the best out of it. And yeah, I mean most importantly is to grind and work hard and not give up. That's a great way to finish uh, today's demo. So thanks a lot for joining us for doing the demo. Amazing tool. Thanks for doing this in open source. And yeah, please send me the links and uh, we will include them in the video. Thank you for inviting. Thank you so much.